So, continuing our discussion, we did we mentioned that CAPAM model, which is capital asset pricing model, is basically a practical application of the single index model. So, in the single index model, you consider that R i or y, which is the dependent variable, is, de is dependent on x, which is the independent variable, and you had alpha, which was basically the height at which the line cuts the y axis plus an epsilon, which was the white noise. So, once you take the expected value and when you basically try to find a one to one correspondence with the kappa model, what you have is on the left hand side rather than y, you have basically r i minus r f, which is the excess return of a particular stock over the risk free interest rate is equal to basically the beta, which is tan of the theta, the, uh, the tan of the theta angle, which is in concept to the simple um, uh, linear equations, which we study in class 10 and 12 is equal to y is equal to m x plus c. So, beta and m are basically the slope and x is basically the excess return on the market with respect to the risk free interest rate and obviously, the error term which is there would in both the single index model as well as in the kappa model, we consider that expected value is 0, hence on an average is 0 and obviously, we will have a the white noise, the variance would come into the picture and, and we have seen in this concept of this market risk and non-market risk, diversifiable risk, non-diversifiable risk and so on and so forth. So, what CAPM is doing is that basically trying to replace the concept of risk from the domain of standard deviation on variance for each and every stock to one particular measure which is basically the beta which we have already considered. Now, if we consider that CAPM model, again I am repeating it, if in place of R i you have a certain portfolio R p with the actual stocks being exactly equal to the market in, in the same proportions, then the value of the beta will be 1 if and only if the market and the portfolio which you have formulated basically go hand in hand or they are in tandem. That means, they are just a replica of each other, but you are as you are not able, aware that how will you basically buy some proportions of that index in actual case, you hence you basically formulate a, a portfolio which mimics the market to the maximum, maximum possible extent. Now, uh, continuing with the CAPM concept, we will consider the security market line. The CAPM model can be expressed as a graphical form by regarding the formula as a linear relationship, linear relationship between the market and the particular portfolio or the market and the particular stock whatever we have and that is considered as an excess return. So, we are considering the case that we will invest in that particular stock or in that particular portfolio in some positive amount if and only if, if the returns are greater than the RF. But obviously, the scenario will change if you consider short selling to be there because in the case of short selling, they would be in the negative proportions as we have seen in the last uh, two days different type of problem formulation or in the Markowitz problem formulation where the weights can be negative also. But obviously, we will follow the principle that the sum of the weights is equal to 1. If you do not follow the, follow the Lindler's equation and sum of the mod of the weights is equal to 1, if you follow the Lindler's model, but corresponding to the fact that normalizations are done accordingly. So, this security market line, this is a relationship termed as the security market line as is shown in the next slide. So, what you have is again the straight line with a tangent which is equal to the beta and the y axis is touched by the line at the value of f, which is r f, which is the risk free interest rate and it is tangent to the curve, which you always should know and I am sure you remember. If this is the value of market, so what you are doing is that you have that value of q, such that it is tangent to this. So, q and market are exactly the same for the concept of the one fund theorem and obviously, if you extend it, you have the minimum variance point, which we are not going to consider because we have already discussed that earlier. And the security market line, there is a there's subtle ch changes. So, in the in the efficient frontier, what you considered was you had the value of sigma or the value of sigma square. That means, this is the standard deviation, this is the variance and along the y axis, you basically had the r i's bar. But now, in this case, the y axis remain the same as it is here, but the x axis rather than the variances of the particular stock, we have basically the covariances existing between the particular stock and the market. So, even though we bring a different measure of, of, of different concept of risk between the market and, and the particular stock, 
or we can consider the sigma squared, but still the properties would basically be such that they would portray the same amount of information and same concept if we consider the single index model of the kappa model or try to basically compare with that with the security market line. So, again the concepts are same, the tangent would basically give you the same information, while the point m would give you the same information which is the market and so on and so forth. As we can see in this curve, which is the security market line as well as the end in the graph which you have already considered is the efficient frontier one, which is the risk return profile which you are drawing. Now, if you have a different version of the security market line, like trying to basically visualize in a different way. So, rather than drawing sigma square in the x axis or covariance of the particular stock with the market or the covariance of the particular portfolio of the market, let us basically try to depict another concept of risk which we have already discussed is the beta. So, rather than drawing the variances covariances, let us draw the beta value along the x axis while the I, 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 y axis remains the return. So, if you draw it again you will get the same sort of graph, but remember one thing here the beta values would be one exactly at the point where the actual market value and the return of the portfolio exactly match such that when you compare the excess return of the portfolio to the risk free interest rate and equate it to the excess return of the market with the risk free, risk free interest rate, then the beta value would come out to be 1, which means that the market and, and the portfolio are going hand in hand. So, if you have a look, this again is the risk free interest rate, this is the straight line, considering there are n number of such risky asset plus the nth plus 1 being the risk free interest rate. And the market value basically, if you drop down a vertical line, then it basically will touch the value of beta, which will be 1 depending on it is exactly equal to the market as such or the portfolio which you are formulating is exactly equal to the market, which means you already have this. So, if these two values are same, then the value of beta comes out to be 1. In both the graphs, that means security market line considering covariances are being plotted along the x axis and the security market line considering beta is being plotted along the x axis, we have different variables in the x axis as mentioned here again, which I told in few minutes back. Remember that the essence of CAPAM emphasizes is that any asset or any portfolio should fall on the security market line, thus this line expresses the risk reward structure of a particular asset or a set of assets which is the portfolio according to the concept of CAPM and considering the CAPM is basically true. And it also emphasizes the risk of an asset or portfolio is a function of the covariances of the market or equivalently a function of beta. So, what we are trying to do is that if you remember few slides back, we discussed that CAPM model is trying to basically replace the concept of risk using beta in place of standard deviation is exactly what is being said again that whichever you look at, at, at the concept trying to basically analyze the, the concept of returns with respect to expected value of return and trying to basically analyze the risk with respect to sigma or covariance or beta, all of them give you the same concept where the risk return profile is the way how you try to analyze any particular stock or a portfolio with respect to the market. So, closer they are, they would exactly mimic each other, further they are obviously the beta values or the standard divisions would be far removed from each other. Far removed means the market risk as well as the variance or the uh, risk of the portfolio or the stock which you are formulating. We know that the systemic risk which you already discussed is given by beta i into sigma square m, where beta i is the beta value of that particular portfolio of that particular stock and sigma square m is the market variance. And the non-systemic risk is given by the variance of the white noise. The systemic risk is the risk associated with the market and cannot be reduced because obviously sigma square m cannot be 0 and neither can beta be 0 because beta 0 means basically you have a certain stock which is not varying with respect to the market is basically in a way a fixed value stock or a deterministic value which is not possible. And, and while the market risk cannot be reduced with diversification, but the non-systematic risk can be made zero with diversification because if you remember we have to take weights of that particular stock in that portfolio. 
So, if you have n number of such stocks and if you take weight of each of them as 1 by n, then technically increase n to infinity can be made in such a way that the overall un non systemic risk which is coming from the white noise can be made 0 in the theoretical sense. Now, consider an asset on the capital market line and in that case it would be efficient for portfolio which is formed by investing some proportions in the market portfolio and the rest in the risk free interest rate. So, if you remember rather than going back to the diagram because we have been uh, con uh, conceptually trying to analyze the diagram long time back starting from say for example, the Markowitz model and so on and so forth when we draw the risk return framework. So, if you draw the efficient frontier in the, in the efficient frontier problems when we considered, there point Q and point F are the two extremes. So, if you had short selling obviously, you could extend the straight line beyond Q depending on whether riskless lending and borrowing was allowed from the bank. Now, if you consider the same thing here also, again it gives you the same concept. If you have the market, if you have the risk return framework being there where the risk free interest rate is also there, then you can basically follow depending on what your risk return profile is, invest some proportion of your money in the so called market or in Q or M whatever you denote and some proportions you can basically invest in the bank. That means, either go to the bank, invest or take out money from the bank such that short selling is allowed and utilize that money to invest in Q in some proportions or in M in some proportions. What are the proportions that you can find out very easily if you solve those problems as we have already discussed. Now, this efficient frontier is formed by investing some proportions in the market portfolio and the rest in the risk free interest rate. In non systematic risk is 0, then the portfolio is exactly on the capital market line. So, more the non systemic risk is greater is the shift of that particular portfolio with respect to the straight line which is the market line which you already discussed. So, consider this is the market line. So, along or and you have basically along the y axis r bar or returns and along the y axis you have sigma. Again we have now sigma, it could be beta, it could be covariance of the particular portfolio or the particular um, asset with the, with the market. So, that does not matter conceptually. So, what you have is that if you see the dotted lines as shown here. So, any particular stock which is there exactly on the on the line is exactly in line with the market and it has got all the information for the market. But any point which is on the right is definitely not efficient. Now, you may be asking and trying to visualize how is it. So, let us go back to the risk return framework which you have already done. done. So, this was the risk return framework when n number of risk assets were there then you had basically the risk free interest rate continued the tangent. Now, any set of points in here were feasible, but they were not efficient in the sense only the efficient line would be in this case. Let me use some other color. So, any efficient line would be this straight line and any set of points which is a contender to be efficient or is a contender or a set of the feasible set would be this set of points. Now, if you are below somewhere here, it means what? If you consider your risk return profile, your overall risk or overall return is such that you can attend some portfolio or some asset which would definitely give you some higher returns for the same value of risk or if you go to the left, you can basically achieve a lower level of risk with respect to the same portfolio for the same level of return. Now, if draw a simile between the concept which you have considered there and if you see the diagram here is exactly the same thing. This point is any portfolio which is being formed in some proportions of the market M and the risk free interest rate. So, it is if it is in between the length is exactly equal to L and L here and considering the total length is 2 L, it means that you are investing 50 50 percent of your amount of money in the market or in some proportion in the asset inside the market such that is exactly equal to 50 percent of the total amount of money and you are investing rest of the 50 percent of our money in the bank. Now, if you again, if you go extended here, it is basically short selling from the bank. Now, the set of points which are here, all the sets of points which are below the straight line, 
they are according to the concept which you have already done, they are some feasible set, but they are not optimal. So, more away from they are from the straight line or below they are from this curve or below they are from the straight line, in whichever diagram you draw, whether you are trying to basically draw in along the x axis the covariance of the, of the particular stock with the market or the beta value or the standard deviation, whatever it is, further it is from the straight line more inefficient it is. So, it means that if you follow the straight line dotted linear here, it means the portfolios use systematic risk and non-systematic risk being there, but the systematic risk is such that there would be inefficiency in the trying to find out the actual price of the portfolio based on which you are trying to basically mimic that particular portfolio or that particular stock with respect to the market. For performance evaluation, we have the CAPM model as given. Now, if you look at this equation very carefully, the left hand side is again excess return on that particular portfolio or that particular stock with respect to the risk free interest rate. Only fact is that R f is fixed, so hence is value theoretically we are saying is constant. But rather than R i bar, we have now basically a hat. Hat means a basically an estimated value of the actual population, which means that if you had the whole population, all the number of readings which you have had for a particular stock or for a particular portfolio, the expected value you would have found out, the expected value formula which you have already discussed is basically given as the actual average value of the overall population. But now, if it is not available to you, what you do is there you pick up a small chunk from the population which is known as the sample and then take the average of the sample which is known as the sample size. So, we will consider the sample size to be the best mimicking characteristics of that population such that the difference between the population mean and the sample mean is as low as possible and it basically has some characteristics in the statistical concept. So, we will consider the hat to be there. So, what we have is the excess return of the sample average over the risk free interest rate and on the right hand side again we see you have the same thing. You have beta, now it is a beta hat because you do not have the overall population, you take a sub sample of that or sample of that and try to find out the best proxy or the best value of that beta such that it is given by beta hat. And again inside the bracket you have the excess market return over the risk free interest rate, again the market return is given by the same sample average corresponding to the market only. So, if you had the actual population, this beta would have been the actual beta i, this r m would have been the actual r m or in the actual sense it is this expected value and this one would basically be again this or the expected value. Now, if the left hand side has E of R i and the right hand side has beta i and E of R m and basically if they exactly match, then we will say the beta is equal to 1. That means, the market is exactly equal to the stock or the portfolio or vice versa. Now, even in case if it is not, still the beta value would be there, but in the long run if there is certain difference between the expected value which you are trying to find out along with the sample average or the expected value or the actual value of beta i with respect to the sample beta i which you find out or there is a difference between the expected value of the market along with the sample average, obviously there would be some differences. That differences we will basically denote in the financial terms in the CAPI model as j or the Jensen's index. So, higher the value of j is more is the, di the, the difference between the average value from the population in the sample which means that the sample is not able to mimic or portray the exact value from the population, less the value of Jensen index is, we will basically assume and, and consider that the sample average is able to mimic the actual population average to the maximum possible extent. According to the Kappen model, the value of J should technically be 0, which is right, because if the population the average are exactly the same, then obviously the equation which you have for the population, where expected values are being used and not the hat values and the hat values equation which you have. So, there would not be any differences which means the j value is 0. Hence, j measures and approximately how much the performance of any index or a stock or a portfolio has deviated from the theoretical value of 0 
A positive G implies the stock did better and a negative G implies it did the worse. But the question would be on the long run what is the value of J? So, J has both positive values, both negative values. So, if you add up all the values in the long run for different samples, theoretically it is exactly be 0. So, you can consider in some sense J is a sort of error or the white noise. So, on the long run if you add up all the values of J or if you add up all the values of the white noise, the expected value comes out to be 0. The value of J tells us nothing about the fund, but instead it is a basically a measure of the volatility in the kappa model. If kappa model is valid, then every security fund portfolio whatever you are formulating from that particular market satisfies the kappa model exactly. If you find a so called efficient portfolio security line with non-zero J, then the market itself in inefficient. So, in case the market is efficient, so obviously J value can be 0 and positive or negative and if the market and the portfolio mimics each other exactly or the portfolio which you are follow, following is following the kappa model exactly, then the J value would be 0. But if there is an inefficiency, which means the two things, either the market is inefficient, which is possible or else the portfolio or the prices which you are following up does not follow the exact efficient cap cap model to the maximum possible extent. So, how do you basically find it out? So, consider again the same market capital market line or the security market line whatever you say, but only remember in each and every slide be careful about what is the x value, what is being drawn on the x axis. Here again we see rather than sigma square rather than covariance again we are trying to depict the beta value and along the y axis it remains as r. Now, if your actual market line is a straight line, then depending on the value of j being positive and negative, your actual portfolio which you are formulating, which is not the market, the portfolio which you form p or the actual stock which you are formulating can be either above or below. But on the general sense, if you add up all the value values and try to find out the, on the differences in the long run average value, it comes out to be 0. Now, there is another index we will also consider. In order to measure the efficiency of a security on the market, we use S which is basically the Sharpe index. So, Sharpe index basically gives you the ratio of the excess return on a particular portfolio or a stock over the risk free interest rate divided by its standard deviation. Now, we have already encountered Sharpe ratio. If you remember, when we are trying to basically rank the portfolios according to the excess return on the particular portfolio or a stock with respect to the risk free interest rate in the numerator and in the denominator you had either the beta or the standard deviation and based on that we had that rule. The rule was if you re can recollect we had this R i minus R f this is average value divided by beta can be greater than equal to some c star can be less than equal to some c star or else in place of beta you can also replace by sigma. So, whichever concept you follow you can basically have both the cases of short selling being there, short selling being not there and if you remember we had discussed that in the last class. Now, if you find out the ratios of R i minus R f by sigma is exactly equal to the sharp ratio which you have considered. So, sharp ratio can be utilized as a proxy in order to decide whether you will invest in a particular stock or not invest in a particular stock in what proportions depending on whether short selling is allowed or not allowed. Now, if you draw the market line again see there is a change in the x axis we had just replaced that with sigma. So, whether you see use sigma or whether use beta or whether you use covariances the conceptualization of the of the actual result is same in all the cases is basically trying to look at the same thing in different angles or trying to basically put up a different colored lens or colored goggles and trying to see the same thing in different perspective. So, if you have the market line and if the market is it's, it's by itself inefficient, so what you will do is that basically your actual efficient fund portfolio Q or the, or the one fund portfolio the market is this one, but if it is basically inefficient then obviously the market line which you have which is the bold one which is just I have drawn would basically fall. That means, it will go down in this direction, which means more inefficiency being there, it will mean the market line would basically fall more towards the 0 degrees. That means, it will the theta angle which you have here will start decreasing. So, obviously, it would mean 
that in order to basically fit a particular portfolio or an asset, you basically need to be aware of two things, whether the market is efficient or whether the stock price itself based on which you are trying to draw the, the particular stock point along the market line, whether it is pricing is in, inefficient or efficient. So, both of them can be inefficient and in that case basically sharp index and the Jensen index are basically a proxy of the num amount and inefficiency which is there in a combined format for both the market as well as the pricing of the particular asset or the portfolio. Uh, 